Good morning, church. Okay, um, I have having a little bit of sore throat, and if later on my, I start to lose my voice, don't be distracted. Just imagine Rod Stewart is speaking tonight, today, this morning. Okay, I, 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 I am excited to be speaking this morning, and so excited that I think I got a little bit too uh, overboard, um, got a little bit too ambitious for what I've prepared today. So I'll try to keep things engaging. But I, remind, I am reminded of a story of uh, Winston Churchill. He is uh, a big deal, right? He's a Prime Minister of Great Britain. He was um, a, a wartime leader. And so he was invited to a, a commence, commencement speech, right? For many of us who uh, study universities will know. He had a commencement speech. So he's invited to give a speech, and everyone was anticipating what he was about to say. And um, so... This, he just went out to the platform. And this is, he went out to the platform, went to the podium, and he, this is what he said. Young men, all I have to say to you is summed up in these three words. So at this point, there's great suspense, right? Great suspense. They were, oh, what's, what's he going to say? What are the three words? And he said this. These three words are, never give up. And then he continued. Never, never give up give up. And then he continued, never, never, never give up. And with that, he walked off the stage. <laughs> okay, so this is, um, this speech thing wasn't really that short, so it was just a legend, but it actually gave me a, an, an idea. Because if you can't remember what I'm about to share this morning, just know this, always trust God. Always Always trust God. Always, always, always trust God. <laughs> yeah, I can go already. <laughs> That's it. Okay. But let us start with our prayer first. God, I pray that you'll come open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. I pray for a powerful word in season, and may you speak into each and every one of our lives. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are going to read from a passage in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. And let me just take you through. It's a long passage. Joshua, chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, Son of Nun, Moses ate. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people, get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give to them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, or the Hittite country, and to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So now imagine with me that you are Joshua. And your leader for the past more than 40 years has just passed away. He was a great leader that God used to deliver the, the nation of Israel out of Egypt, out of slavery. He was the person that gave the great directions for the new fledging nation. He was also the, also the one that God gave the Ten Commandments true. Now, his contribution was so great, and his standing amongst the people was so great, that even the Bible at the end of Deuteronomy described Moses as, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses. And so, because Israel needed a new leader, and with the passing of Moses, you have been appointed. You have been selected. And you know that you have very big shoes to fill. But who are you, you might ask? The guy, Moses, literally talked to God like a friend. 
At the end of 30 days of mourning, to, by some estimates, there are more than 2 million people in the camp. So you walked out of the tent, 2 million pairs of eyes looking at you, waiting for your instruction, waiting for you to give them the direction on where to go. You know that you have to bring them to cross the Jordan, the Jordan River, and into the Promised Land. But you also know that across the river, the Canaanites, they are a well-equipped, rapacious, battle-hardened group of people. So, you are not expecting that the odds are against you, and you are, the, the, the military odds to you are, are against you. Now, finally in your mind, self-doubt begins to set in. Because just over 40 years ago, you and Israel lived as slaves. Many of your compatriots 40 years ago were afraid when they saw the cities. What did they say? They said, we are like grasshoppers. They even wanted to kill you for insisting that we go in to the land and take it as God promised. How will this be different this time round? The experiences and images are really quite hard to shake off. But over the next seven years, God will deliver you one victory after another. You will lead a military campaign with a success that like no other. Cities after cities will fall and be conquered. Armies well equipped, more powerful than yourself, will be subdued. And at the end of the seven years, the land will come to a rest and you will inherit the land which <clears throat> you have heard so much about from the days of your youth. So not so long ago, Israel was picking out and rationing manna from heaven. But now you are drawing out plans to divide out among the, main, the, the, the 12 tribes. In what is one of the greatest turnaround in the stories of the Bible, you have transformed from being wanderers to land owners, to inheritors of land, from slaves to conquerors. At long last, you have finally witnessed the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that God will make you into a great nation. The book of Joshua is an important study of personal breakthroughs and collective victories in God. It teaches us about the unfailing promises of God springing from the, um, His unfailing faithfulness. What is really the key to their success? My short answer is this. They demonstrated courageous faith. Courageous faith in a God who will deliver no matter what. In our quest to fulfill God's call for our lives, to arrive at His destiny for us, having this courageous faith truly is the make or break factor. That is why God commanded Joshua in chapter 1 verse 6, be strong and courageous because you lead these people to inherit the land I saw to the ancestors to give them. I would like now to break this part of courageous faith into three essence, three elements, or you like to call it. And that's the first part that I'd like to share with you is that first, courageous faith is preceded by trusting in God's preparation. The key here is in the waiting. Now, some of us might be guilty of this. We we pray to God and we will say this, God, can you give me more patience? Everyone, any one of us uh, pray that? Yeah, we pray. God, give us, give me more patience and I need it right now. Now, when it comes to waiting, none of us, many, not many of us like it because it really reminds us of the fact that we are not in control. We are out of control. Whether you're waiting in a traffic whether you're waiting in the supermarket or whether you are just waiting at the airport or when our network doesn't work so well and it's so slow and we just have to wait for it to load. This really frustrates us. But sometimes in working towards our goal, our moving into our destiny, the hardest part is in the waiting. Throughout the whole Bible, we have many examples of characters who will be made to wait by God. Abraham had to wait 25 years before the birth of Isaac. Joseph had to wait for 13 years before he was promoted to prime minister, premier of Egypt. 
Moses waited 40 years in the desert before he was called to deliver Israel out of Egypt. Jesus himself waited for 30 years before he began his former ministry. So consistently, God used period of waiting as a key teaching tool in our curriculum. What does God achieve when he made us wait? He prepares us for the task ahead. He prepares our character for the role that he has called us to. By the time of Joshua chapter 1 that we read just now, it would have been exactly 40 years since they started wandering in the desert. The words of the Lord 40 years ago in Numbers chapter 14 would have still been fresh in Joshua's mind. It says, Your children will be shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your bodies lies in the wilderness. Guess who was exempted? The little children, Caleb, and of course, Joshua. If I am Joshua, I will be counting down for the next 40 years to this day, funeral after funeral. And how many of us know that 40 years is a very long time? Before entering the promised land, God prepared Joshua and his people for what is ahead. He prepared them for their roles. He prepared them for in terms of their mentality. He prepared them, helping them to know God. And here are some of the recorded examples. First one, Joshua the general. So Joshua first appeared in a battle with the Amalekites as Israel was out of their slavery, as, as Israel was moving out of slavery in Egypt. So this happened just after the Exodus. For months, God had rained down plagues upon plagues upon the, on the Egyptians. And Amalek was not oblivious to it. They did not want to submit to this, and they planned an insidious plan to attack Israel. What did they do? They target the weakest and the weary of the nation of Israel. So just imagine, they were moving out of Israel. It's a whole contingent of them. Who will be at the rear? The people who are tired, but people who cannot move as fast. And that is where the Amalek, Amalekites attack from the, from, the, from the rear, to try to get an advantage over Israel. Now, Moses, at this point, sent Joshua to lead the battle. And it was a battle with mirac miraculous result. What happened? As long as Moses lifted out his rod, the rod of God high, Joshua had victory. But when Moses' hands led downward, Joshua began to lose. So eventually, the victory was complete. Israel won the battle, and that victory was clear to the nation of Israel that it came from God. You see, Joshua had military background, but this was the very first time he fought as the army, as a soldier of God. And he continued to do so over the next 40 years. Second, Joshua the minister. So before Joshua was the leader, there was Joshua the minister. And he actually translated as assistant. He was an aide to Moses. Now, when Joshua appeared on Mount Sinai with Moses, everyone else was wait, waited below. Even Aaron didn't, manage, didn't, didn't go up. So Joshua went out to assist Moses, and the cloud of God covered the mountain. And for six days, the glory of the Lord fell upon the mount, engulfing Moses and Joshua. Like a devouring fire, the presence of the glory of God was marvellous, even from afar, in the sight of Israel. And Joshua was right there with Moses. So Joshua would have learned the reality of God, that in the midst of God's glory, Joshua became convinced of God's beauty. He experienced God, allowing a fear of the Lord and awe of Him to grow. We know that for the next 40 years, he continued to be the minister, the assistant to Moses which leads to my next point. Joshua developed a personal relationship with God because Joshua is found at the tent of meeting, the meeting where Moses met with God, consult with him. There, jo Moses will speak with God face to face as a man speaks out his heart before the Lord. And through observation, Joshua learned that God is personal. He, found, he watched Moses as he gets wisdom and counsel from God he saw Moses pour out his heart before the Lord. And through observation, Joshua will learn that God is found by those who seek him. 
The above are just examples of Joshua's preparation as the eventual leader of the nation of Israel. But how about the people? Right? He's not just the only character there. There are the people. The people also experience a gracious provision and protection from God. As Joshua entered the land with a whole new generation of people, they were mostly born post-exodus. They neither witnessed the parting of the Red Sea, nor did they witness the amazing victory of, against the Amalekites. But despite wandering out in the desert for the most part of their lives, they will never be in need. They will experience fruitfulness, protection, and even provision. And in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 7, it says, The Lord your God has blessed you in all the work of your hands. He has watched over your journey through the vast wilderness. These 40 years, the Lord your God has been with you, and you have not lacked anything. Finally, the people experience the Lord's battle and won. So this is crucial because the new generation of Israelites were prepared and they had to experience fighting the Lord's battle. They were instructed to fight armies more powerful than themselves. And this happened after 38 years of wandering where all the previous fighting men, the previous generation had all died out. So they were without training, they were without experiences and they had to fight. But the Lord handed them victories and they defeated Sihon king of Heshbon and Og king of Bashan. And Moses reminded them in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 8, that so at that time we took from these two kings of the Amorites the territory east of the Jordan from the Enoch Gorge as far as Mount Hermon. What's the significance? They had a foretaste of what is to come. Essentially, fighting wars, fighting battles, gaining victories, and then after that, they occupied the land. They took the land. So this was a foretaste because they, when they won against the Amorites, they took the land and divided it among the two and a half tribes of Reuben, Gedites, and half tribe of Manasseh. And you just imagine at this point, when the time comes, when Joshua gave the command to get ready to cross the Jordan River, in chapter 1, verse 16, their response was a stark contrast from the previous time. This is what it says. Then they, Joshua, sorry, then they answered Joshua, whatever you have commanded us, we will do. And whenever, wherever you send us, we will go. They were ready. They were ready to take the land as per God's promise. So Moses, in his final preparation for Joshua, summed this up. At that time, I commanded Joshua, you have seen with your own eyes all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. The Lord will do the same to all the kingdoms over, over there where you are going. And do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. Forty years is a long time to wait. But they waited. And God used it to prepare them for to inherit the promised land. Listen, whenever God put us through a period of waiting, it is His training for us. It is because maybe we need our faith to be tested. Maybe because our hearts and our motives need to be purified. Or maybe we just simply need to get to know God for who He is. He is God and we are not and that we will learn to depend and rely on Him fully for our needs. The point is this, when we trust God for our lives, He will never waste any of our experiences, good and bad. He will never leave us alone, but He will train us, teach us, prepare us for His call on our lives. Are you now in the season of waiting? What do you think God is preparing you for? Have you waited and prayed for so long that you begin to doubt whether God is ever listening? Take heart of all the experiences that we've learned. God is still at work in your life. Hold on to Him, trust Him, trust in this waiting because God is faithful and no experiences shall be wasted when He is in control. Amen? 
Next, the second element is that having a courageous faith is to stand on God's promises. We trust in the promise giver. I'd like to show you the, the passage again, Joshua chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. And this was the promise made to Joshua. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. And at this part, he is drawing out the boundaries for Joshua. Because it says, Your territory will extend from the desert, which is the south, where they started from, to Lebanon, which is the north. And from the great river, the Euphrates. The Euphrates is a river that runs from Syria, current Syria, to modern Iraq right now. And so that is the east boundary to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. Next. And no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, I will, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you lead these people to inherit the land I saw to their ancestors to give them. If you break down this passage, essentially we'll see three components. Number one, is awesome in magnitude. Number two, it's solid in, uh, in the assurance for us because God promised to be with us. And third, it was a guaranteed victory for Joshua and Israel. But let us look at the scope of God's promises, which is the territory. And um, let's show the map. In essence, the area to be conquered was immensely large. Okay, just, I, I pointed to you the, the, the boundaries just now. But just looking at the green... So this is the ancient biblical map of Israel, all right? not the current one. The green color portion is the, con is the, ones, is the conquest done by Kil um, Joshua. And the pink color portion okay, is probably the closest Israel ever came to in terms of uh, fulfilling the, the full extent of the promise. And that was under Solomon. Okay, so you can see that even from Joshua's time, the, whatever they have fulfilled, whatever that he was able to accomplish was far, it's, it's almost less than half the size of what, at the height of their power, Solomon, King Solomon was able to achieve. So, Joshua at the end of his life knew that the job was not done. And this was mentioned in Joshua chapter 13, verse 1. When Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, You are now very old, and there are still very large areas of land to be taken over. You see, God promised Israel that He'll be with them and give them every place that they set their foot on. It is like my kids' dream was that if I ever tell them, step into Toys R Us, whatever toys that you set your eyes on or set your foot on, you'll be given to you. Now, you see, the promise was awesome, but there's really one catch. Israel had to step in to the promise and stand on it. This was best, I think, is best illustrated by the miraculous crossing of the Jordan River. If you remember the map previously, the pink color side, draw a line in the middle, that's somewhere where the Jordan River is. Now, here, this is a river that is uncrossable. The people had no idea how to cross the Jordan River because at this point, it is at the level of a flood tide. So high, 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 in, high in terms of the level, it, it, was, it was flooding, the current was, 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 was fast and strong. And God simply gave Joshua a simple set of instruction. All right? First, the priests are to carry the ark. This represents the presence of God and they were supposed to move ahead about kilometers ahead of the whole contingent. So as they reached the bank of Jordan, God, the Lord, gave Joshua the next instruction, which is to step in to the river and stand on it. Okay, now, I'd like to point out that this is not our Pongo waterway. <laughs> you, know, just, you don't just step in and just stand there. This is the equivalent, I would say, like the Main Kong River at high tide at flood tide. Or some of us have been to Australia, the, the Great Margaret River. It is that, it's of that depth of that width. Now, they had no idea what God was going to do. There was a big difference. If you recall, the, the, when Moses parted the Red Sea, 
He took the rod, the staff, put it into the water, and he parted. Then what happens after that? Israel walked and walked across the Red Sea, correct? But at this point, the currents are still moving, the flood is still moving, the water is still moving. They were instructed to simply step in and stand there. And what happened was that the Lord did the miraculous work of stopping the water flow. And Israel was able to walk across the Jordan River. God did a miracle in the sight of Israel and also the Canaanites, whom melted in fear. Just a note here, why? The Canaanites at this was only expecting the nation of Israel to cross the river only in a few months' time. Because now it's high tide, right? So they were not, really not expecting them to cross. So they were like, okay, maybe we have more time to prepare. We have more time to, to wait for their, their, their adventure coming. So what God did for the nation of Israel was military brilliance. He has given them the element of surprise. By stopping the river, they cross it very quickly, and voila, now they are at their doorstep, which is why they melted in fear. And they, they, as they witnessed the power of God, and they, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a powerful military advantage. They were not prepared. Now, what the priest did was symbolic of us having a courageous faith, that we proceed on the basis of God's promises. We can step in and stand on God's amazing work. Joshua gave us the key in what we can do. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Keep this book of the law and always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Which means that he had to be so familiar with the word, both in his mind and on his lips, that by speaking, by reciting, reflecting, meditating, teaching, dream about it, so that what? He can be careful to do everything in it. And cultivate was great because it helped us to develop a diligence in reading the Word of God. Now, what does standing of God's promises mean practically? Can I tell you a story of mine just to illustrate this? A few years back, even before Ethan, my son, was uh, to be enrolled into primary school, my wife had a, and I had a serious uh, discussion. And it was whether to volunteer, parents volunteer, for one of those branded schools so that we can give Ethan a better chance to study there. So none of us came from branded alumni. So um, that's life, right? We, have, we considered that option. So we deliberate hard over this. And like most parents, we want to give the best leg out for our children. And in the context of Singapore, it is academic success or education, these are top priority. To be honest, the time and energy needed for volunteering is quite, to me at least, right, it's quite a piece of cake. Uh, I mean, this is in comparison with service in church. So anyway, just to be very clear, but most of you are not parents here, I have nothing against volunteering. But in our prayers, we were confronted with two issues. A, Opportunity costs, because it would be added commitment to our already busy schedule. And I know that I have to make compromise somewhere, at home or ministry. B, confidence in God to take care of our children. So these two issues kept coming up when we pray. I know to many of you here, most of you here, young people, that you might really see hey, what's the big deal. Can I tell you that? Many years ago, when me and my friends, we had no kids, we all sat down, 10 out of 10, all said, oh yeah, we will not ever be Kyasu parents. Can I tell you what? When we reached parenthood, 9 out of 10 of us all backslided. <laughs> all become Kyasu parents. But let me tell you what we can all identify with, even if you're not a parent. And that is the fear of losing out. You're either fear of losing out for yourselves or for your children because you think you make some sacrifices by serving the Lord. So back to the issue of confidence in God, this really hits a raw nerve with myself and my wife, right? Because when we look around, somehow most of our friends, they all have some, their children are all going to some branded schools, right? They're all going somewhere. And for 
those of our friends who, who, who may not have that access, they all tell me, of course, go and volunteer. Lah. Just, what's there to think about? That, of course, led us to wonder if we should try harder to secure a better future for our children, right? The pressure is real. But as we prayed, we just felt the need to trust God on this. I don't have to make, we, we, we felt that we, I don't have, we, we shouldn't make any compromises and to continue to, for me to continue to focus on ministry. We just felt, as we prayed, the assurance that we can take hold of God's promises, that He will take care of our kids as we serve Him. So we trusted God, we make a we make small step of not acting on our fears, but we follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I want to make this as relatable as possible because I think many of us will identify with this, that the feeling that whether we should have done more for our children comes back from time to time. It lingers on, it did not go away. I mean, even when we make the decision, we have already moved on. And this was especially so after the balloting was done. And guess what? Ethan did not end up in the one, in one of the branded schools, right? He, he was in the school that's not of our top choice. And so, it was even more so because we just stayed right across one of the, if some of you may know, Hokkien Hui Kwan School. It's just right across us. And we were disappointed that, that we did not get it. So, even after making the decision of trusting God, the fears can still come back. We can still struggle. And can I tell you, and can I encourage you that this is normal? And that is really okay? Because at the end of it, this is a growing process, a maturing process. As we take small steps to trust Him, submit, him, submit to Him in your prayers, and growing to see God's assurances for our lives. The story did not end there because, so the school starts, right? Honestly, it's not too bad because every school is a good school. <laughs> it's true. Uh, honestly, it's really not too bad. But really to my pleasant surprise, our pleasant surprise, my son was made the monitor of his class. And he was, even at the end of the year, awarded the class role model award at the end of P1. Yeah, we, to the picture. <laughs> yeah, my wife said I should have blocked out the school name, but okay. <laughs> Every school is good school, so it's a good school. <laughs> and because he was a class monitor, he was made to take care of some of the, some, supervise some of his fellow classmates, which um, honestly wasn't so easy. But I could see that he could handle them calmly. He was growing in his uh, management of, of other people. <laughs> I don't know, okay, I, I was glad he could experience this. And um, I usually don't open my mailboxes. I waited until it's like over full, overflowed and I could see the letter dropping out of the letterbox. Then I went to open. Then I just realized, this is February. In December, we received a letter from the CDC telling us that my son has just received the EduSafe Bursary Award um, I don't know for what, but yeah, it was, it was good, lah, I guess. I know that he was delighted because uh, he's going to receive a $120 popular voucher. <laughs> and uh, he was excited because he wants to buy more Minecraft books and games. <laughs> my son, Ethan, my, 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 my daughter, Vera, I, they're still young, still a long road ahead, and we know that. But... These are just really small encouragements for us as we trust God. We knew in our hearts, my wife and myself, that this is affirmation from God. Now, my question to you is this. Is the fear of losing out or preventing us from answering God's call for our lives, for your lives? Is the fear that you have to take control in order to secure your best life? As many social media posts would like to tell us, right? Stop you from trusting Him more. If you are, you might just be really missing out on your best life because you're living in fear and not by faith. But if you wish, start this day 
make a decision to trust Him because by making first small steps, our faith will delight the heart of our God and we will see His favour as His plans unfold in our lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> now, to, okay, not many of you here, but still some of you, but to many of my fellow parents, especially the young parents, trust God with our children. Our greatest challenge is not to raise the next scholar, but a generation who will fear God and serve Him. Our job is to set an example for them in our lives, deeds, speech, and in what it means to love and serve God. And by the grace of God as a community, we will be able to do it together. The third element that I want to share with you to, to this morning is to move in God's power. Courageous faith is to move in God's power. And that is really experiencing the reality of His awesome power. Before the crucial battle of Jericho, there was an interesting encounter by Joshua. He was by himself, probably worried about what is ahead. So far, so good, everything has gone well. But this is the first time that he's going to engage in a siege battle. Because up to now, the battles that they have been engaged in are the open field kind of battle. Two armies meet together, same level of playing field. Yes, been, they have been successful in this. But a siege battle heavily favours the defenders, where they will fight on higher grounds behind fortified walls. And Jericho being along the Jordan River, right, it is especially built up and fortified. So the Israeli army was not equipped at all for such kind of battle. I really doubt they were specialised weapons like a battering ram or a siege tower where you can assess the top of the tower or even catapults launcher. They are pretty much a ragtag army. In normal circumstances, the casualties are expected to be high for attackers in a siege battle. So after celebrating a Passover, Joshua wanders from the main camp towards the city of Jericho. He was probably praying, surveying the ground, thinking about the strategies that he can employ to win the battle. He was deep in his thoughts when he encountered a strange man in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went out to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. This is a very familiar type of encounter, similar to what Moses experienced with the burning bush. Who is this commander of the army? We have good reason to believe that this man that appeared to Joshua is God himself, the pre-incarnate Son of God. We know that he's divine because Joshua fell face down to worship him without rebuke. What is the significance of this incident? By appearing to Joshua at this moment with a drawn sword, God is really saying, I will take care of this. That although they, the Israel, will be fighting the upcoming battles, ultimately it was God himself who will be waging the war for them. The important question was not whether God was on their side, but whether Israel was on his side for the impending conflict. This is immediately apparent in the Battle of Jericho. Remember, Jericho was a heavily fortified city filled with well-equipped soldiers, better hardened soldiers, and God gave Joshua a plan that doesn't really make sense at all. The instruction was this, to have seven priests, seven trumpets, and to march around the city for seven days. It was so ridiculous that the city of Jericho, midway through, was laughing at them. But they did. They continued on. They marched once every day for six days, before finally seven times on the last day. And they let out a war cry at the end of it all. Ugh! By this, it was recorded that the walls of Jericho collapsed, and Israel charged in and took 
the city. A simple seven-day ritual, ridiculously comical and irrational in the context of war, toppled the walls of Jericho. The point is this, the decisive defeat of Jericho confirmed God's power and presence with Joshua and Israel. In the mind of the nation of Israel, this incredible victory was fought and won by God himself. Not by any brilliant strategy, not by valiant soldiers, but by God himself. This as well is a promise to us and our lives. We have victory because God will fight our battle. And how do we tap into this battle? Into, this, into God's power by seeking the Lord in our prayers and to move in the Spirit. What happened when Joshua failed to consult God? There were two examples in, after the Battle of Jericho. The first example was the Battle of Ai. That after the destruction of Jericho, the Israelites attacked the smaller city of Ai with just 3,000 people. And I I don't know, I suspect they, they might have done the same thing, watching around the city, but it did not work this time around. 36 men were killed. They were routed, they fled, and it was recorded that the hearts of the people melted and become like water. So there were evidences that Israel was overconfident at this point. And there was no mention of Jer Joshua seeking God because there was no instruction given. So it was only after the defeat that Joshua became discouraged and asked God, why? Why? Why they were defeated? His face was, his face was on the ground, fell flat down. So God revealed that Israel had sinned at Jericho. Achan had disobeyed God's command to destroy everything. I believe that this could have been avoided if Joshua had prayed and the Lord would have revealed to him. And only after Achan and his household had been dealt with that God instructed Joshua on how to conquer and take the city of Ai. The second incident was a deception of the Gibeonites. When the residents of Gibeon first met with Israel, the Israelites did not know that there were Hivites, which is basically one of the people that they were not allowed to make a peace accord, peace deal with. Um, how? how? How did the deception happen? The Gibeonites deceived Israel into thinking that they were from another region, not within Canaan. And the Israelites covenanted with them to preserve and to, to, to not destroy them and basically sign a, a peace agreement. In Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, the Israelites sampled their provision but did not inquire of the Lord. What provision? Basically, the Gibeonites, they brought their biscuits, their, their bread, it was moldy, and said, look, we come from afar. This is the evidence of it. And they look at it and say, okay, uh, that's good enough for me. And they, and they made a covenant with them. They did not inquire of the Lord, and they were deceived. Did Joshua and Israel learn their lesson after? They certainly did, because at least what was recorded in the Bible, they went on to fight 10 other battles, prevailed over all of them, after seven years, the land was finally given rest and Joshua divided the land amongst the tribes. In all of the battles, Joshua inquired the Lord and it was recorded that the Lord gave instructions. And so finally in Joshua 21 verse 43 to 45, it says, So the Lord gave Israel all the land that he had sworn to give to their ancestors and they took possession of it and settled there. The Lord gave them rest on every side just as he had sworn to their ancestors. Not one of their enemies withstood them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their hands. Not one of the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Everyone was fulfilled. The victory is awesome. And I suspect that many of us looking at this story will wonder if this is applicable to us. Can this ever happen to our lives? We think to ourselves, yes, I'll remain faithful, but you know, this is not at my level. This is not... Is this are for, these are for faith giants. I would like to challenge this thinking because I think God is interested in our lives. He wants us to inquire, to seek His counsel because that reflects trust and dependence and He pleases His heart. You see, Joshua stood up as the leader who served faithfully from the start to the end. 
And rightly so, because the English translation for his name is in Hebrew is called Yehoshua, which means God delivers. This is basically the same name as Jesus in Hebrew, Yeshua. And if Jesus, who is our Joshua, can deliver us from the most impossible predicament, condemnation and eternal separation from God, and achieve the greatest victory for us, what can our Lord not able to deliver us from? With prayer, we need to move, we need to step out and move in power. I wrestled with God whether to share this, but I simply couldn't shake it off. So, here goes. Some of you might know that uh, I recently made a big change at work. I joined my good friend, Lo Yao, and now I'm basically self-employed. So, I'm still essentially doing what I was doing previously, but I'm on my own and there's no salary. So, when, I'm, when I left my job without a job late last year, Actually, even doing this was the last thing on my mind because within two weeks, I actually had three job offers. And one of them offered me to head up one of his team, one of his department. So I practically said yes to all of them at some point. But instead, I was disturbed. I was nudged. I, I just felt that this is not where God is leading and that I am to go with the self-employment route to start something on my own, to, in Pastor Sally's words, fly out into the sea and fish out in the open ocean. When making such decision, I am um, thankful to have people like Pastor Dan and Pastor Sally to pray along with me, my, and even to receive a confirmation to go ahead. My wife is at peace and agreeable as well. And honestly, honestly, if not because I felt that God is leading, and Loyal will probably disagree with, with this. I honestly think that this is crazy. Crazy for someone like me in my life stage to do this at this point. But why am I sharing this? Because in these two short months, God has been leading every step of the way. He gave me a vision for my business. He gave me a narrative to share with my clients so that I can market and position myself strategically. I kid you not, I was in showering and I was just praying, God, I need a vision, I need a vision and it came. He gave me the strategy which sector to target on, which location, which buildings, which assets to, to target, which clients to talk to. And I must say that it has been easier than I've imagined. I used to have a global brand behind me and doors were not open so easily but now it just feels that God is ahead of me working ahead of me even though sometimes I still wish that things can move a little bit faster but I'm learning and I've learned to trust God with the process with the journey my point is this can God speak directly into your situation maybe some of us here are at this juncture for our careers our studies, our business, our relationships, and even church ministry. Is it time for you, for us, to trust God more and to move in His power? And how about us as a church? I have the privilege to visit the past few weeks um, our overseas churches in Chiang Mai, in Phnom Penh. I'm so encouraged and moved to see that both of these churches have bounced back from the COVID storm. The people are in good spirit. They are serving passionately. And what I see now are both churches renewed and starting on a fresh new chapter. Amelia, wife of Pastor Elwin in Phnom Penh, she's ever the encourager. She texted me saying that, may God lead and bless and multiply all He has gifted you both, me and my wife, for His kingdom. But the key is of what? this text is about is this. On the missions field, what we have experienced is how God opens doors and we walk through in obedience and joy. God is able. God is good. Amen? This is a reminder to me 
of God's power and faithfulness. Our God is big and He can move us to a new level. A new level of anointing, a greater level of impact through our ministries and maybe a new permanent venue as a base to, to, to conduct our mission for Christ. For whatever it is, personal, interpersonal, ministry and church, let us develop a courageous faith and to see God moving among us. Let us pray. Dear God, we just want to come before you to ask for this courageous faith, O God, to see your hand moving in our church, in our lives. Lord, we know that you're interested in what we are doing. Lord, we know that you're never far away from us. And I pray that, God, that we will come against, O God, the lies that exist in our head. But Lord, to instead take hold of your promises for us, that you are good, you are powerful, you are, you are faithful, and you have the best plans for us. I pray that, God, that as we stand in your promise, in your power, that, Lord, that we'll overcome this fear of losing out. We'll overcome the need for control. Lord, we will overcome and to move in your power such that, Lord, that we can step into your call, into your destiny for us. Because, Lord, only through you that God will find the greatest fulfillment and, and, and joy and purpose for our lives. For this, we trust in you. We pray for power. We pray for victory. We pray for this, for our faith to continue to grow from strength to strength. In Jesus' name, we pray all this. And all God's people say, Amen.